Hello, this is Dr. Tom Murtaugh of the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio, on behalf of the International Cardio-Oncology Society. Today we present a highlight from a recent webinar discussing the complex and important topic of cardiovascular complications in stem cell transplant survivors. Our highlight today features a review of important institutional data on this topic brought to us by Dr. Armenian. Dr. Armenian comes to us from the City of Hope Medical Center located in Southern California. A leading clinician in the field of cardio-oncology, Dr. Armenian is a pediatric hematologist-oncologist who is also chairman of pediatrics while directing several programs at the City of Hope, including the Survivorship Program. He holds the Baron Hilton Chair in the Department of Pediatrics. ICOS is proud to bring you this highlight, and we encourage you to visit our website, where information is constantly being updated. You can also use our website to find board-certified cardio-oncologists, cardio-oncology centers of excellence, and of course, many links related to education. So please enjoy Dr. Armenian's presentation. So what you'll note here is, let's just look at cardiovascular disease, and the most and the worst outcome is cardiovascular mortality. What you'll note on the x-axis is that these figures are starting at two years post. So you made it to two years um, without cardiovascular disease. What's the incidence of cardiovascular disease in the transplant population compared to the general population? And you'll see that there's a marked increase and a divergence away from the general population, which is in the dotted line. At City of Hope, we looked at not just the mortality, but the burden of morbidity. So what is the incidence of cardiovascular issues such as myocardial infarction, stroke, and heart failure? in the survivorship journey. And these are all one plus year survivors. So you made it to one year, what's your incidence? And what you'll see is that the incidence of cardiovascular diseases continues to increase. It doesn't plateau, but what's more important in the subsequent publication we showed now nearly 10 years ago, was that compared to the general population, transplant survivors, after taking into consideration age, sex, modifiable risk factors, et cetera, have a greater than fourfold increased risk of life-threatening chronic uh, cardiovascular issues. So yes, it's part of it is driven by the treatments that they receive, but part of this is really driven by the higher burden of modifiable risk factors that emerge in the transplant survivorship journey. Again, starting the clock at two years, you'll see a much higher incidence of hypertension, renal disease, dyslipidemia, and diabetes that continues to increase and widens in incidence between what you would expect for the general population. So why do we care? What do these risk factors do? And, 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 and we showed nearly about 10 years ago now that, in fact, there's it's sort of a dose-dependent in, uh, increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease with each cardiovascular risk factor that you're adding, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, so that if you have more more than two of these risk factors in your survivorship journey, you have what you would consider intermediate to high risk of cardiovascular disease um, in the general population. So these are folks that when we were studying, they were in their third, fourth, and fifth decade of life. These aren't folks who are sort of in their eighth and ninth decade of life. So we were very much, uh, so initially we described the burden of disease, but we really wanted to take it one step further and really provide clinicians and providers a strategy with which you could uh, risk stratify in the clinic, um, take into consideration available uh, demographic as well as treatment related information. So we, Eric Chow and myself at Seattle, we took our two cohorts. We had nearly 1800 and Eric had about a thousand or so of patients who were long-term survivors of trans central transplantation and divide and, de and develop this uh, cardiovascular risk prediction model. Because we recognize that the traditional cardiovascular risk prediction models, uh, whether it's ACC or Framingham, et cetera, really underestimated the burden of cardiovascular disease in this population because the weight of the scores were not tailored to the transplant patients. And they also did not take into consideration treatment exposures that drive the risk. And in fact, we developed a number of, we looked at a number of variables, including demographics, modifiable risk factors, um, anthracyclines and radiation, devised the, um, as it derived the associated hazard ratios with, for cardiovascular disease, and then developed these integer scores uh, that really weigh the contribution of these individual risk factors to subsequent CVD risk, and then develop and looked at the cumulative incidence of CVD over time. And we're able to nicely stratify individuals into what we would consider high risk, intermediate risk, and low risk of cardiovascular disease. And what you'll note in the high risk subgroup 
the 10-year CVD incidence exceeds 25%. So one in four will develop CVD in this category compared to, and then the intermediate risk is somewhere around 10% or so. It's now, not just enough this, to describe. It, it, in that particular study, was yeah. chest radiation different than whole body radiation? Uh, no. So um, it so we did not see... So total body radiation that's given for allogeneic stem cell transplantation uh, does not necessarily um, contribute to increased risk of cardiovascular disease. This is really radiation to the mediastinum that's typically used for uh, things like Hodgkin management of Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So less than 12 gray of radiation to the total body radiation is not associated with CVD risk in this particular population. Super, so, thanks. Um, and then what we did was then we took our this risk score that we devised that was able to risk stratify individuals into high, intermediate, and low risk, and then looked at it in the Fred Hutch cohort, and we saw a similar delineation between high, intermediate, and low risk with an AUC of somewhere between 0.75 to 0.8, depending on what your outcomes were if you were looking at all cardiovascular disease versus heart failure versus coronary artery disease. So this really helped us think about um, more effective strategies for the survivorship journey it's not just to identify who's at high risk, but just as important, it's to identify who is at lowest risk so that you can appropriately counsel them as in from a more positive messaging standpoint. So why are these folks developing CVD? And this is a work that uh, Lee Jones and, and others have been thinking about for many years, and, and I've essentially modified these figures to help understand or contextualize the CVD burden. So we all know, I talked about this physiologic reserve, but the cardiovascular system has its intrinsic cardiovascular reserve capacity that's maintained by optimal cardiac output, pulmonary function, muscle integrity, and oxygen carrying capacity. And it's really our margin of safety around cardiovascular disease. And many of our cancer patients have baseline increased CV risk factors. They have the, their, their de novo cancer diagnosis, there's depletion of those reserves and cardiovascular toxicity. The depletion happens both through direct injuries both chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and radiation, as well as indirect injuries um, where there's some natural aging process, as well as de novo modifiable risk factors, as I mentioned earlier. And this is just another figure explaining the same concept is that there's, we all know that there's gradual depletion of your cardiovascular reserves over time. And then at some point, all of us, if we live long enough, we're going to develop cardiovascular disease, if, if not cancer. Um, and what happens in the cancer patients is that there's a change in the trajectory so that CVD develops at a much earlier time point um, than what you would expect for the general population. So when we talk about cardiovascular reserve capacity, how do we measure it? The most effective way of measuring it is looking at VO2 peak as you uh, as, as obtained from cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And I think everybody in the, uh, in, in the audience knows that, you know, it's ultimately it's sort of your best measure of, of physiologic cardiovascular reserve and it's inversely correlated with death and cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality. Um, so Lee and others have really looked at, we initially started looking at this in the breast cancer population, looking at VO2 peak and on the x-axis is age. And what you'll notice is that in breast cancer patients treated with cardiotoxic therapies, their VO2 peak on average was 10 to 20 years or, uh, worse than it was, it was lower than what you would expect for a sedentary adult women. Essentially someone in their 30s and their 40s, their VO2 peak was comparable to someone who was in their 40s, 50s and 60s. Um, in, in the general population, sedentary adult women. We kind of looked at the same paradigm and said, do we see the same thing in our transplant population? So in an initial sort of pilot study, we looked at VO2 peak in transplant patients and plotted it against what you would expect for the general population. We saw a very similar sort of shift in this VO2. So um, the VO2 peak of um, someone who was a transplant survivor was essentially 10 to 20 years um, uh, sort of older than what you would expect for um, the general population. Someone in their 40s um, was a similar, had a similar VO2 peak as someone in their um, uh, 50s and 60s in the general population. So that sort of gave us some signals, but we really want to interrogate a little bit more. If we really believe that VO2 peak is maintained by optimal sort of um, uh, function of both the lungs, the heart, blood, and muscle, and you look at the oxygen cascade of initially inhaling it and ultimate uh, O2 and ultimately delivering it down to the muscle for mitochondrial respiration, you realize that you need optimize you need to, you need sort of optimization of all organ systems to be able to have maintain a cardiovascular reserve over time. And what I'm going to argue over the next few slides is that our patients, 
it's not just that the cardiovascular system, the traditional cardiovascular, the heart and the, and the blood vessels that are taking a hit. It's all the other organ systems that are taking a hit that help maintain CV reserve. So let's look at lung function. Uh, we know that there's acute toxicities that happen that are that damage the lung, whether it's the transplant conditioning itself, graft versus host disease, infectious complications, as well as other complications like intestine, uh, interstitial pneumonitis. We know that this, this hit happens shortly after the stem cell transplantation, where there's a decline in a number of PFT-based parameters. There's some recovery, but not complete recovery. So there's acute toxicities and damage to the lung. We at City of Hope said, okay, well, that's we know that's acute toxicities. How about if you fast forward and look at five, 10 years later, and in fact show that nearly a third of patients who are cancer survivors, um, the overwhelming majority of these were stem cell transplant survivors. Nearly a third will have diffusion capacity abnormalities, even when they're asymptomatic, and restrictive lung disease in about a quarter of these individuals. And that impacts a substantial amount um, their health-related quality of life especially when compared to the general population. So pulmonary toxicity is acute as well as long-term. So we know that's hit number one to a major organ system that maintains VO2. Let's look at the heart uh, and, the, and the, so let's look at the, the vasculature. Uh, the vasculature takes a number of hits, especially after allogeneic stem cell transplantation. So you have your initial baseline C, the demographic risk factors, you have the initial chemo radiation, then you undergo transplant, there's conditioning, chemo, and then there's hormonal dysregulation um, that could then contribute to the development of the novo cardiovascular risk factors. Then there's also direct toxicities to the endothelium, whether it's graft versus host disease, immunosuppressive therapy. Ultimately, this accelerates endothelial injury um, and drives a accelerated atherosclerosis phenotype that we have seen. So blood vessel injury is definitely prevalent. Uh, how about the heart itself? So this is work that was recently, a couple of years ago, published in Kruchak Cardio Oncology, looking at a very common use strategy to, for prevention of graft versus host disease, which is post uh, conditioning cyclophosphamide. So we give post your traditional chemotherapy, we give a small dose of cyclophosphamide to deplete the T cells from the donor to, to um, minimize the risk of graft versus host disease. It's a very common use strategy and what these investigators showed, in fact, that the cyclophosphamide that's given in the post-conditioning setting was associated with a much higher rate of LV dysfunction in individuals who are asymptomatic within the first 100 days, so acute cardiac toxicity, and this was independent of established modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. Why do we care about acute cardiac injury? in the context of post-cyclophosphamide um, in, in PT side. Uh, well, as I mentioned, we give cyclophosphamide post-conditioning to prevent graft versus host disease, which is a deadly complication that can happen. And these investigators showed that PT psi or post-cyclophosphamide was associated with lower incidence of graft versus host disease. But the flip side of the coin was that it was associated with increased cardiac events in this particular population. And developing a cardiac event shortly after, and this is, in this case, it's LV systolic dysfunction, in the acute peritransplant period was associated with worst survival. So it definitely has clinical implications. We were very much interested in going beyond LV dysfunction and look at other parameters and acute complications of stem cell transplantation, in particular, allotransplant and how it impacts outcomes. <laughs> Um, so we going beyond cardiac dysfunction and cardiomyopathy, um, looking at some complications that are quite uh, prominent. Uh, so this is work that was um, at our center led by Ellen Chang. Um, we, what we looked at was essentially clinically significant atrial fibrillation that developed post allogeneic stem cell transplantation that required medical intervention. So not looking at sort of a transient events, et cetera, uh, because we really wanted to, didn't want to deal with sort of screening biases, things that really resulted in medical management. What was really remarkable is that just in the first few days after allotransplant, the incidence of AFib is markedly high. So the overwhelming majority of the burden of AFib is happening in the first few weeks after the stem cell infusion. So then the question is, well, it's AFib. You know, how does this impact outcomes? Uh, the reality is, is that there's a dramatic change in survival rates in those who develop AFib versus those who do not. Um, and in fact, patients who develop AFib have 
quite in short in, in that sort of peri transplant period, what you'll see is that they have a five year survival rate of less than 20 percent compared to 60 percent in um, for patients with that without AFib. And if they're adjusting for all known modifiable risk factors, as well as disease related risk factors, et cetera, um, development of AFib was associated with greater than threefold risk of all cause mortality. So while one of the things you'll have to, we'll have to understand is that, that, that there's a lot you can do before someone even goes to transplant to help develop sort of the risk model of, of you know, what are, the, what, are the, what are the areas that uh, we need to be aware of. And so for this study, it wasn't just enough to describe the burden and the outcomes, but it was also important for us to see if there were pre-transplant biomarkers that we could pick up that would help give us a clue as to who's going to develop AFib. And we went back and retrospectively re reviewed all the images of patients who develop AFib versus not, and um, primarily focusing on the left atrium uh, and looking at a number of echocardiographic parameters, in fact, showed that patients who develop AFib had significantly worse LA ejection fraction, as well as significantly worse LA reservoir function as measured by LA strain. And these are all individuals who had normal ejection fractions, LV ejection fractions, pre-stem cell transplantation, because that's a criteria for referral. And under, you know they would never transplant anybody with an abnormal LVEF. So you have normal LVEF, but there's a number of these folks who have abnormal LAEF as well as reservoir function. And these are subclinical parameters that you could theoretically measure prior to anyone going to transplant and, and be much more vigilant in the management, uh, both pre as well as peri-transplant for these patients. So there's things we can do in a peri-transplant period. How about longer term? What, you know, patients undergoing allogeneic transplant? So I said cardiac events are common in the immediate post-transplant period. How about five, 10 years out? Uh, individuals who are asymptomatic or are walking around, uh, what happens if you do routine echocardiography and look at their cardiac function? So this is work that was, um, I believe, done in France, looking at serial imaging for patients who underwent allo transplant 10 plus years before. Compared to the general population, they showed consistently that they had markedly worse LVEF. In fact, nearly 20 to 30 percent of these folks had abnormal LVEF compared to what you would expect for the general population. And there were a number of modifiable sort of variables that came in, um, but the prevalence was actually quite high um, in folks who are just walking around uh, and, and they're essentially what I would consider a ticking time off. Uh, we were very much interested in looking at the auto transplant population, uh, looking at patients with lymphoma who are five to 10 plus years after stem cell transplantation, looking at strain as well as LVEF and traditional diastolic function, et cetera, in fact showed that for folks who are walking around, when you bring them back to the medical center and perform comprehensive cardiac phenotyping, you'll see that nearly uh, one in five, uh, so it's more than 20%, will have a um, uh, uh, abnormal cardiac function as is defined by established parameters of um, by ASC and ACC and otherwise, et cetera, compared to what you would expect for the general population. So we brought in controls as well, age match controls, and the prevalence in the age match control was somewhere around 4%, which is what you would expect as part of the spectrum of you know, the standard deviation curves uh, for many of these uh, continuous variables. So a high prevalence of cardiac dysfunction. And then the last area that I talked about, so we, we said abnormal lung function, abnormal vascular function, heart function, and abnormal muscle function. So um, that was the hypothesis. So why abnormal muscle function and why would that drive CVD risk? So many of our patients, you know, have profound sarcopenia in the peri-transplant period. Why sarcopenia? Uh, because they have prolonged immobility, uh, they're in bed for weeks at a time, poor, uh, poor nutrition, chronic inflammation, disruption of anabolic hormone, hormones. And this is two CT scans from individuals who, by all accounts, were the same on the outside. So same sex, diagnosis, age, race, ethnicity, et cetera. But one on the right is sarcopenic. This is looking at the L3, L4 level, looking at abdominal musculature. And the person on the left was not sarcopenic. Same BMI as well. So internally, it's muscle depletion that's happened in one versus the other. What happens if you look at patients pre to post, you'll see that the BMI declines, but this is dri driven largely by changes in skeletal muscle mass. And what are the implications for skeletal mass, muscle mass depletion? If you lose skeletal muscle mass during your transplant, your risk of non-relapse mortality is substantially higher than those who don't. And a lot of, a lot of this is driven by cardiovascular events compared to those um, who do not have muscle depletion. 
So those are all different pieces, lungs, heart, blood vessels, muscle. And, you know, we've been studying these in sort of across observational studies. We have now developed a cohort that we're following recently funded through the NIH, where we're longitudinally phenotyping our patients comprehensively to try to understand what are the relative contributors of these muscle systems and muscle system injuries to VO2 decline over time. Uh, we're essentially phenotyping folks baseline, pre-transplant, six month, one year, and two years post with cardiopulmonary exercise testing for all of, all of these patients, and then combining that with comprehensive 2D echocardiography, pulmonary function testing, muscle ultrasound to evaluate, to evaluate muscle health, quantity, and quality. We do bioelectrical impedance analysis to look at the, the relative distribution between muscle and fat, as well as functional measures. And the reason is what we want to do is we want to develop as comprehensive a picture of what's happening at each time point and what organ systems are contributing to this depletion, because there may be differential contribution of organ dysfunction to VO2 depletion across the trajectory of stem cell transplantation. Why is it important to phenotype and then ultimately phenogroup? Because transplant patients and their cardiovascular disease are general are generally different than what you would expect for the general population, both in terms of severity and the types of um, um, disease that you see. And, and this is work that essentially was looking at HEFTEF uh, and looking at ways in which you can actually phenogroup individuals across a number of patient characteristics. And I truly believe that phenogrouping and ultimately risk stratifying and treating patients according to phenogroups is really where we need to be thinking about for our transplant patients that have complex phenotypes. And this paradigm of phenogrouping really has to be what is driving the science moving forward. I trust you learned a lot of useful information from that review of the cardiovascular issues facing stem cell transplant survivors. It was especially interesting to hear the information on cardiopulmonary performance and its impact on outcomes. If you are not a member of ICOS, please take the time to sign up for this exciting and growing organization. You can find information on membership and all things related to cardio-oncology at ic-os.org. Until our next webinar highlight, we remind you to treat cancer, protect hearts. Mm -hmm.